Welcome to Season 2 of the Psych Sessions Network podcast, Teaching Matters, co-hosted by Rob McIntarfer of Lincoln Public Schools and Eric Landrum of Boise State University. These 10 episodes in our second season were recorded from the beginning of May through the beginning of September 2021. And as you will hear, we wander and meander quite a bit. However, there are themes for us that emerge, such as the roles that AP psychology and IB psychology play in U.S. high schools, the continuing challenges of assessment, and how scaling innovative pedagogies makes utilizing those principles all the more difficult. To take a deeper dive into understanding the IB psychology world, we invited Casey Swanson, a Michigan-based educator, to join us as our first guest on Teaching Matters. We broke away from our typical conversations in other ways, too. For one episode, we chatted about Albert Bandura, and Eric shared some stories from his own personal interactions. One episode in season two had to be marked explicit. And if I repeated that word here in the introduction, then I would end up having to mark all of these episodes explicit. We end season two stumbling on what perhaps could become a subtitle for our Teaching Matters series here. See what you think. Teaching Matters. Oh, Rob, but Eric, I am not going to give you any more context than that, my friends. You'll just have to listen. Please enjoy listening to season two of Teaching Matters. Oh, Rob, but Eric. All right. Well, welcome to uh, another episode of Teaching Matters. What a special treat, huh, Rob? Absolutely. I get to introduce two friends to each other. This is, uh, is this a first for us? I got to think this through. I think so. This is a first. Well, yes, please introduce to our listeners who's joined us today. Well, this is a treat for us and then a treat for people listening because up till now, they've just heard us yammering on and now we're adding a third yammerer. Okay. Yeah. Eric, this is my friend, Casey. This is my friend, Eric. Hi, Casey. Eric Eric and I know each other from way back. Society for Teaching Psychology Things, AP Reading Things, a bunch of mutual friends. Eric, Casey, and I know each other primarily from the APA National National Summit on High School Psychology. We met there, and Casey and I have been corresponding about a bunch of different things, including IB Psych. Casey's my buddy who knows more about IB than anybody else um, in my life. And I enjoy learning from him. And Casey, Eric, is my buddy from higher education who is super thoughtful about teaching and many other things. So I'm excited to get you guys together. I'm excited to be here. Rob, this is a hard way to break some news to you, but Casey and I are starting a podcast. And sorry. (laughs) Nice. So Casey, how did you enjoy your experience? We're going to get to your background in a minute, but. How did you enjoy your experience at the high school summit? That is an experience that really, I think every high school educator should get to experience something like that within their discipline. As psychology teachers at the high school level, you're often by yourselves. If you're lucky, you might have another singular colleague to teach with. And here was a room full of not only a hundred teachers, but also psychology professors and the names that you see in the books that you have, you received at your AP summer institutes, who's uh, you follow on Twitter, that you go listen to talk at different conferences and you're sitting right next to them, having coffee and uh, beer and, you know, food to eat, just learning about the collective community. So it was a, a really excellent experience. And I can remember vividly the, uh, the bus ride from the airport to, to the housing site out at, at Weaver State and instantly just looking around at it, all these people that are smarter than me, know more about psych about me, I've been at this longer than me. And I was just really looking forward to being a sponge for the, for that week. I, I think and Rob no, sent across and asked questions and I was instantaneously drawn to, to Rob because he had so many questions and was just a, such a natural inquirer, which is part of, I think my relationship with him today is that he just asked such great questions. Honestly, I think only the third one that you listed in that trio is true. They probably <laughs> had only been at it longer than you. If I'm remembering the trio of items, Casey. 
Could you just tell our listeners a little bit about your background and especially your expertise in IB psychology would be awesome. Sure. So I started as uh, my undergrad or undergraduate degree is in history and psychology. It was a double major and the state of Michigan requires really that students or teachers be certified in social studies versus history. So I had to go back and take a couple extra courses here and there, but I'm predominantly a history and psychology major. At the high school level, opportunities to, to teach some of the advanced Pelley classes come up only so often. And there was an opportunity to teach AP Psych and I jumped at it because, because of the class. It's an awesome class with great content and it's an elective. So students get to, to choose to take it, which creates a great environment for from there. Our school started up international baccalaureate program or an IB program. And I jumped because I had some friends that had taught it before, but also, and so this is, is not a knock on, on the AP world of things. I just wanted more focus on research, writing it, communication, and not so heavy vocab, but I wanted more conceptual framing of the discipline. And so when that opportunity came up, I jumped and I threw myself in head first. So the first year I could, I started examining after teaching it, I started marking papers. I put my, my name in the hat to be a workshop leader, to just get connected with as many people as I possibly could. And then I try and pay that back. So I like to be part of the APA summit, for high school psychology, I found a couple more of my, my group, a couple other IB psychology teachers there and right away, just form a relationship. I want to get back as much as I can uh, to the community that's, is I think going to continue to push and challenge all high school students to be just exemplary students of psychology and hopefully helping to advocate for it as well at the university for college credit and college recognition, just raising that awareness of what the program offers. So you, you've had a foot in both worlds then from what I'm hearing you, you did the yeah. AP gig and then you did, you, you are doing the IB gig. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. And so how did you know that from what I'm hearing, I think, how did you know the IB was more research focused before you started doing it? Uh, there are some schools around me that offer the program and I just learned about it through some mutual friends and spouses of some coworkers that even from how they taught chemistry or physics or English, greater international focus and specifically with the psychology, knowing that I mean, methods is about 25% of the course. It's a two year course and methods equals about 25 to 30% of that course. And it just is that chance to dive deeper. I would say for context, for, for those listeners that are not familiar with the AP or uh, IB can be a two year course. And I teach about 70% of the content that's in AP and I have two years to do it. And that is magical when I have significantly less content and I have that opportunity to work with students to really develop their skills, their written communication skills. The ability to evaluate, analyze research, to really think versus the fast pace of, I mean, right, we listeners, there are some of you that are teaching AP psych in a semester in 12 weeks, 13 weeks. That's a lot. And for a lot of high school teachers, it's a, that's a lot of content to get through on a, on even a long. So that extra time is just wonderful. I'd like to reinforce something Casey just said, cause I think it's remarkable in high school, in K-12, I'm not sure if this happens a lot in higher ed, but in K-12, I'm a district administrator and Casey does some administration at his school, some administrative stuff. We often mouth the words, um, depth, not breadth. We will often say, teach fewer things and teach them more deeply. Casey, in my experience, that walk is seldom really walked. People usually say that and don't do it because it's really hard to cut stuff. It's way easier to add things into a curriculum than it is to cut things because cutting things is what makes people mad. So doing doing 70% of what gets covered in an AP psych class, maybe sort of kind of, and then stretching that over out over two years is a pretty remarkable statistic. It, it's a, a wonderful experience that uh, I hope any teacher that is a high school teacher that's listening that a district may be pursuing an IB diploma program, you've taught AP or unsure about IB to just jump on that as fast as you can. You learn a lot as a teacher of that as well. So, the, oh, of course. so let me ask a couple more things. So what then, what does the IB test look like? The assessment? Sh sure. So I'm going to speak specifically for those nuanced listeners that might know a little bit between IB psychology, HL versus SL and 
I could, that's a whole nother episode. I'm going to speak to it as if it's the higher level of the HL. There might be some IB psychology listeners that I'm aware of the differences and just, I'm going to speak about the higher level component. It is actually, there are four components. The first consists of three short answer questions and the short answer questions in IB world, it's about a page to two pages. So that's the short answer question. They have about an hour to complete those three short well, one to two page questions. And then they write an extended response, which is going to really look at them to evaluate some sort of theory or model. And in each of these, they have to provide evidence. They have to, if you're going to make a claim about social identity theory or some memory of model or enculturation versus acculturation, you got to have some evidence to support that claim. And so students are expected to know literally hundreds of studies and be able to talk about their aims and their methods and their findings and their conclusions and their implications. And they have to really pick it apart and evaluate it for gender considerations, ethical considerations, methodological considerations. They've got to really be re tremendously sharp and knowledgeable and the ability to, to apply their understanding of research methodology to the findings of those studies as they make their evidence or as they make their claims. That's one of the components. And then, and that, that is based off of the pretty traditional bio psych cognitive model, a little bit of questions from each of those. And then schools, this is, I'm really thankful that the IB really values this idea of kind of self-determination, right? They want to have as much agency and choice in the program as they can. And so teachers are allowed to specialize then in either abnormal psychology, health psychology, developmental psychology, or human relationships. And so as a teacher, we get to choose which of those units maybe we feel comfortable with or our students are interested in, and, and then we go down those roads. So the second assessment then becomes these additional longer response questions, which are probably about four to five pages in length. And that's evaluating a theory or model, looking at evidence, really taking those considerations. The third assessment piece is they actually get presented a novel study that's been truncated. It's usually a page or two. And they have to pick apart. They have to identify the methodological choice, strengths and limitations. They've got to talk about the sampling choices, strengths, and limitations, dive into the ethical components, and then they look at limitations and to what extent can I generalize, can I transfer depending on if it's qualitative or quantitative, and then also like, how can I make this more credible? How could the researcher make it more credible? That is my favorite assessment that I think if somehow the DP FRQ could turn into something like that, it would be wonderful because you can't cram for that, you can't study for that. That's a, a very applicable and transferable skill that when we're expecting students to go to university in life, right? how do you interpret studies and research that's in front of you? And I absolutely adore that. And it, it provides such a good predictor for students as they head off to university to life. Just how do they take this novel stimulus and really digest? So those are the, what we call the external. So that's the AP test. Those listeners that are from the AP, they go and sit for that over the course of two to three days. So those are the external exams. There's one more part, but Eric, Jim, or Rob, do you have any questions about those elements before I talk about the last thing? So that third, not in his head. Yeah, that third one is there have been FRQs in the past that are pretty close to that. Yeah. I've been an AP reader six times and not for a while, but I go out to a local high school every year and I just do a brief overview of kind of some tips on how to get ready for it. And I go back and I look at each year, the last six FRQs that have been released publicly. And there are, there have been models in the past where uh, a novel study is presented and the task is to tear it apart, essentially. To what are the flaws? It's more than identify the DV and the IV. It's identify the flaws. What are the concerns about it? What conclusions can be drawn? Making sure that students can identify and dis discern causation versus correlation, all that kind of stuff. It may, it certainly may not be the depth of what you've described, but it's, it's in the ballpark. Yeah, for sure. And that's where like having taught AP for those years too, it helps me contrast some of that nuance of it. Definitely we're looking at this define outline, that addition of evaluation and limiting, where are the limitations of this? What, you know, what populations can we not, or situations can we not transfer this to that? That is just that extra, you know, little bit. And that's not the whole assessment. That's right. just. Part of it, so. And Casey, this is really where your insights are, I think, are really super valuable and super unique, if you can be super unique, is that I don't think there are <laughs> many people in the country, quite honestly, that are steeped in 
both AP and IB. Well, Casey Laura, you should meet in a couple of your high AP school. One. Yeah. Look, Casey, sorry, you Laura should meet in one. I'm sorry, who, Casey? I think Laura Brandt would definitely be one that's in our community that is definitely a leader in this as well. And Leah Green, or Leah Everson Green, Leah Green from North Carolina, she was at the summit. So shout out to Leah. Yes, you're a, a rock star doing the hard work of IB and AP as well. So there are a handful of us that are, are doing this work. Well, I'm guessing there might be literally a handful as in five or less. Well, how many IB, uh, US IB programs are there, Casey? Do you know ballpark that statistic? There's, it's not a ton, right? I don't know, honestly, uh, probably a couple of thousand. Well, yeah. how about the other way? Uh, in the last year where you know the data, how many students sat for the IB exam? Mm, I don't know that offhand. I know Emily, a APA, usually provides that number to us each year. She'll say, oh, this many students registered. I don't know within the U.S. I just get the bigger international numbers. So I just don't. I think it's in the tens of thousands Whereas uh, College Board AP is in the hundreds of thousands. My impression has always been AP Psych is about 10-ish times bigger than IB Psych, but I could be wrong. And I know you've got a fourth as assessment to get to, but it strikes me that a high school that offers IB really has to invest more because you have to allow a teacher to teach as a singular group of students for two years to cover a course. Now that those students may be earning double credits over two years. So the credit generation may be the same, but the, the, the topical coverage of content on one's transcript is one course, or maybe it's depicted somehow differently. I don't know. Yeah, I'm really lucky. I teach at a school that we have actually three high schools on one campus. We're about halfway between Ann Arbor and Detroit. There are on our high school campus, 6,300 students. So it's, it means three separate high schools, but the kids mix and mingle between campuses. And so there's an economy of scale that allows us to do that. I mean, in addition to our IB psychology, we run anywhere between probably 13 and 15 sections in psych each year. And we also, we enter to psych as a a really popular elective at our school. So we run dozens of sections of that as well. So there's an economies of scale that exists, but I would also say that much like higher ed, right? Like if you're going to make an initiative or a change, you've got to have the wherewithal or the fortitude to say, we're going to see this through. The startup of it, it's about five years before you even actually put kids in the chair, teachers in front of a class. It's a four to five year lead up. And that alone is, there's a, a lot, I mean, there's a lot of change in, in K-12 education. I think in part of the strength of this program, and if you're, again, a listener that is, or a faculty member that's listening, or anybody that's listening in your local community has an IB program, I strongly encourage you to, to investigate it and learn more. Is one of the reasons I say it is that because it's a longitudinal implementation, there's a resources committed to it, and you can't really nilly just jump on board with an IB program. It takes a lot of time, intentional professional development, deep investment in your teachers, and I, I think even about the mission statement of IB, the IB aims to develop is the first words of that mission statement. It used the thing as a whole process is with the students and teachers. And I, I just, that's near and dear to my heart, this idea of we view humans as a work in progress and the school journey, the teacher journey, the student journey, the community journeys, again, I think is, is just something special about an IB program that again, any listener out here or teacher that is at a school that might be investing or investigating it is to really strongly consider getting it on board or, or learning more. It's been the most profound professional development of my career being involved with this. I think the economies of scale is a really interesting observation. I, I would bet, and I don't know, and it'd be an interesting project for someone. If you looked at the location of IB programs and AP, quite frankly, and you looked at the location of the programs mapped against population. Mm. I would imagine there's probably not a lot of, of IB programs in rural communities because it would take, it sounds to me like it takes a high level of investment, maybe not so much monetarily, but personnel investment as Casey, you just described, you know, that five year 
that five-year uh, onboarding, if you will. And it takes interesting enough to launch an AP program as well. Yes, yes. Interesting enough, there are some communities that might be identified from a, as a more rural or semi-rural area that have tremendous racial, cultural, ethnic class, like hum, like homogeneity, and they will seek out an IB program to say, we want our kids to start becoming bilingual. We want our kids to intentionally be thinking internationally minded because we want everybody greater economic opportunity. We don't want to settle for low, I would say the poverty of low expectations that might exist of schools of social function. We want to also, some schools will bring it in to say, we want to transform ourselves in terms of expectations. And so there are quite a few programs. I do site visits to schools and I just did a, a one in somewhat rural Minnesota that for that very reason just said. We want to open our kids' eyes to the greater world. We want to let them see other ways of doing things. Not that it's better or worse, just that there's others. There's different perspectives. And we're part of this big world and we want you to see it. That's surprising, pleasantly surprising to me because I, I didn't expect that, but it's super cool that it's happening because I, it is not just a time investment that you talked about. There's a pile of dough that a school or district has to come up with to get IB teachers trained and the tests are quite a bit more expensive for students to take. And hopefully the school or the district is footing that bill. So that's super gratifying that some smaller schools and districts are getting in just to give everybody a sense. If you want to do an AP class, like an AP psychology class at a high school, I think you have to get a high school administrator to say, yes, the teacher has to go to a one week training during the summer and go through the audit and bingo, bango, you can offer an AP psychology class. To do an IB psychology class, it has to be embedded within an IB program. So the whole high school has to be or district has to be involved in it. And then the training is more extensive and offered fewer places. And, uh, and am I in the right ballpark, Casey? Yeah. And, and listeners might be familiar that have gone to NITOP. I will lead a workshop oftentimes at the trade winds in Florida right before NITOP comes to town. And so when I, I, I hear the NITOP people talk about, oh, the NITOP beacon and the NITOP food and yeah, I've been there and something about those magical places though, if you are, are doing a training that's going to involve deep thinking. And this is again, I think about high school educators here who often it's any development might be pushed into an hour after school, after a long day, here you're sent to Tahoe or the coast in Florida or New York city. And you're spent three days doing deep thinking, deep work, being uncomfortable and stretching and growing. And that's not something I can do at the end of a day. After seeing five or six classes with 180 students for an hour at a time, it, it, if I'm going to invest in my teachers to be developed and to challenge their thinking, that they, they need that time and space to do that work as well. Yeah, I'm resisting the urge. And clearly now that I'm talking, I'm not resisting the <laughs> urge. I'm re I, I have this tinge of that the IB program sounds upper class hmm. that you have to live in a upper class area and have money. And I don't mean that as a criticism, although I think it sounds like it, that you have to be in an urban area unless you happen to be very, unless you have to be, happen to be in a rural or a suburban area and very worldly minded and you have to have schools that have the budget that can invest in teachers the way they all schools should be investing in teachers and students who can afford to be in the classroom and i'm glad it's there i don't want to take it away from anybody i just wish more students had the opportunity to opt into it I don't know. Am I, are my concerns? So I, I just certainly hear that. And that is a valid concern with regard to a school has to be able to offer the whole program. I couldn't just teach an IB psychology class to 30 students. Now, once the school has an established program, kids or students are able to take actual courses. The larger skeleton of the program is there. Each year I will have several students that say, well, my intro to class or my intro to psych class, I want to take my IB psychology course and they are able and, and welcome to, to participate in it and are one of the one of the kids in the classes now it's not volumes of kids and i think for us in the state of michigan i would say is that we're limited by our graduation requirements and you know, the state of michigan and many states will say if you do this full 
diploma program, we'll waive some electives for you. You're clearly going career college ready. We're going to waive off some electives, but if you're just taking one or two classes, those are not waived for you, which makes it difficult for students. And I would say this is a very, this concern about equity of access. This is in my perspective, in my world experience, very American centric. Because kind of what Eric, you alluded to is that my Canadian colleagues and my international colleagues, they cringe when they talk about class sizes of 37, they might have hard caps, their school of 12 or 16. And so when they think about from their schools, that may not be a huge investment because kind of as a baseline, they're investing in their schools more. So, so that is a concern. And when I interact and lead these workshops, when I lead a workshop in New York city, there are people from all over the globe that come to New York city for these workshops and trains. We just the thought of sending a teacher overseas to go to a, a four day training that like that just wouldn't happen. I can't imagine in, in really any American public school, we send a, a teacher overseas to go to a four day work. So that is a valid concern, Eric. And it's something that, that, you know, and it's, I would say just like AP is implemented differently at schools, you know, my particular school has no barrier to access. There are some schools that will say you have to be in, let's say French three before you can join the program. Same thing with AP, right? There are some schools that say you must take a intro to before you can take AP and, and that's a, a local decision. And I'm really grateful that my support staff of administrators and my district has really allowed me to say, we want this forever. We want to see our free reduced lunch population go up. We want to see diversity. We, we want to be aware of that. And I'm thankful for that because there are many programs. That's not the case where it is. There's a screen put in place intentionally because we want to maintain our U.S. news and world ranking. And so we don't want everybody to be in the program. So we want to be selected and we want to. And that is a concern. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be hypercritical. It, it, it sounds so awesome. And the more I learn about it, it sounds amazing. And I, I understand it has to be standards and you want people to be successful in it. And the little twinge of concern I have is would students in rural areas have access to it? Would students in from poorer neighborhoods have access to it? And you could lodge the same concern about going to a college or university, about the AP psych program, about any AP. It's about, like you said, equity and access. And I, th I think because maybe there's more mystery around IB. That, that maybe a person like me comes along and questions it a bit more only because I don't understand it. And that's why, Casey, it's really nice to have you to demystify it for me and other listeners. And you got me thinking about, I'm not volunteering for this, but I sure wish somebody else would, a research agenda about student participation in AP and IB psych and then non-AP and IB high school psychology courses. If there were an easy way to gather this data, I would love to get demographic information about participation rates across those different courses. That'd be really fascinating. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I, I know you, I know Casey, you were talking about the size of class, whether it was 16 or 17 or 32 or 33. Well, if you look at, if you look at the idea of one of the goals of AP or IB being college credit the equivalency of college credit, um, at Boise State, our general psych courses would range from 75 students to 250 students. So no matter what, a high school student is going to get a smaller enrollment, more intimate experience, whether it's IB or AP. For sure. Boy, this For connects sure. to some conversations we've had before, Eric, about given the goals of your class, what are the preconditions that need to be in place in order to get those goals accomplished? We talked about that in face-to-face -face versus online teaching, and there's probably some different things you can do in a huge class versus a small class, and it's not necessarily all weighted toward the small class. I know some of you uh, who teach huge classes in college do some remarkable stuff with a huge class that you really can't do with a small class. It just might be different goals. But trust me, two years with the same group of students. <laughs> yeah. There are some bonding and some yeah. relationships that you could form. Yeah. That are, I would imagine are pretty special. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for a high school educator. It is, I mean, 
It is magical. And I will say right before I hopped on today, I, I reached out to a couple of my alumni and said, Hey, what are some things that you would want me to pass on to a larger cool. audience? And I was just talking to one of my students who is at a, a big 10 university down the road uh, from me. And as a, a first year student, she is the, the amount and frequency of participation first year students in undergraduate research opportunities is very disproportionate from the students that are in my school's Ivy program. And, and this actually leads into that fourth assessment component that I think is really valuable that I want to make sure we talk about because they're doing the research. And so this fourth thing, which is about 25% of their grade, it's called an internal assessment. So in general, it's scored by the teacher and then it's sent to examiners around the globe. And there's some inter-rater reliability that occurs where I'm going to take a sample, you know, we are 50 kids, I'm going to read 10 of them. And you up or mark you down, give you some feedback as a teacher as well about where you're scoring and, and what you're doing. Maybe not as, as great. In the Ivy psychology course, the students are replicating or doing a slight modification to a cognitive psych study. So they have to really zone in on or zoom in on a, a theoretical model. They're examining the body of work around that theoretical model, and then they'll replicate or a slight modification of one of those cognitive psych studies. And that could be depth of processing, right? That could be reconstructed memory. I let my students choose from about a list of 40 and they can really examine them and, and know that there's challenges to each of them. There's opportunities for each of them, but we go through the independent review board or institutional review board, right? They have to present it. It's a great scaffold assignment. It takes about five weeks for them to do. And so they have to really work on summarizing their theory, thinking about what modifications are going to fit based on the population they have access to, right? They can't just go out and conduct research anywhere. It's coming in the school. So sure. There's some saving limitations. Absolutely. But the lovely part of it is it allows them to talk about it and discuss it and what would they do differently? We don't let that be the limitation of the whole study. Yeah, we name it and address it, but in the end, they've got to work through procedures. Then they've got to standardize those. Um, then they're, when they actually run and collect the data, I mean, they're getting informed consent because most of the participants are minors and it's all the ethical considerations are met I mean, they're doing a lot of work to prep that. And then they actually, once they conduct it, I mean, they run an inferential stats test. They're having to make a decision about am I running a coccinum or running a man with you? Like, what am I doing? Why am I doing that? Am I looking at ordinal data and nominal data? Like they're doing that work and it's messy. It's messy as all get out. And that's the part, right? You think about our mission to develop. And, and, and then as they, they run their, they run their inferential and descriptive stats, then they have to publish their findings. Yeah, it's not going to go to a journal, but it's getting them familiar with how do I set up the theoretical model? How do I go about constructing a, a, an experiment to test this, secure the participants, run the data, analyze it and publish some findings that have discussion about strengths and limitations of my design and my procedures. And they have discussed, am I using match pairs? Am I using any independent measures? Like they have to do that. And yes, it's a 16 or a 17 year old. But I think about when you think developmentally, when you teach your young people to ride a bike, the first time you expect scraped elbows and bloody knees. And the next time they do it, it gets better and it gets better. And so my long-term arc of this would be students are doing this type of work in all of their classes in the Ivy program. They're learning how to run geographic studies and new studies in the geography class. They're designing experiments in their chemistry or biology class. And when they do that in six of their courses, throughout their high school experience, they walk into a university, say, I want to participate in undergraduate research, not in two or three years. I want to do this now. How could I get involved? And they're going to seek out those opportunities. And what a wonderful experience for them to say, I've made my first round of mistakes. I've done this and it's ugly, but I've done it. I've, I've worked through that. I've challenged myself and then this is all the things that I've learned. And so it's. We see a lot of students participate in graduate research right out of the gate, all semester in their first year. So Casey, who, so is it the IB teacher training that makes sure that IB teachers have that skill set to teach all of that? Um, yeah. So in part of the training, and then there is also teacher, I mean, teacher initiative, but we are also required to be trained every, I think it's six years. So we go through this tiered level of training. You know, the first time you're that deer in headlights, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never heard of IB. I may have content knowledge, but there's a lot of scaffolded support for teachers, teacher support materials, some great publishers out there as well. There are a lot of great resources from 
social networking community that of, of some experts in the field. And then you go to another training four or five, six years after you've done it for a few years. And there's this whole nother depth of wisdom and experience and you see things differently. And there are a lot of program reviews as well. So as a, I'm a program leader at the school. So we have the IB sure. quality reviews and there's a lot that goes there, but we get quite a bit of data from IB as well after the exams. And so there's a lot of data that I get about teachers' performance um, that is used to help support their growth. And it's very specific feedback on, on in psychology, it's going to be very directed at which areas are you strong as a whole, where do your students succeed, where do they need to grow? And that's meant to help me improve my performance. So what you're described, what you just described is amazing. This is why Rob and I were smiling while you were describing it. So I have, I only have about 14 or 15 questions for you. <laughs> so the students who take IB psychology. Is anybody at IB World Headquarters tracking how many of those students go on to become psychology majors? So you have some data that the alumni, when they get their scores that are released from IB and their exams, they try and register them for alumni database. And they do some general tracking of, they try and get an email and contact, but then they will try and track where you're matriculating to, what are you interested in studying? And they look for some declarations. Now, this is where, again, as a dad of my own three boys and as a champion of, of children, we often think about students are directed to push towards like, you got to be this major or that major or really focused at the start. If you don't know what you want to do when you're 13, like you're behind. And we actually love when we see this data internationally that certainly about 30% are choosing to go in the STEM fields, a broader STEM field, 10% in the business. And there's a smattering of others, but about 60% of my graduates self-select undecided. And we love that as a badge of courage and honor and to say, yeah, we've done our best to expose you to a wide variety of things and to know the complexity of the world that as a 17 year old, I don't know what I want to do. And that is something that we don't push too hard because yeah. I don't want to bias individuals. Yeah, I'm not talking about any pushing at all. I'm just talking about tracking. And I'm just talking about, about their name, their ID number, their scores on all their IB. And then four years later, checking in and seeing, did you do you have a degree? If so, what was it? Eight years later, 12 years later, do you have a degree? If so, what's it in? I would love to know the relationship because I think as you've described it, that is an amazing experience. And I'm wondering to myself, why is IB psychology the best kept secret in psychological science? Why aren't, why aren't they screaming the benefits of their program? Is it, That's is it different internationally, Casey? Is it an American versus other parts of Europe thing? With regard to familiarity and screaming about benefits. It is an American, I would say it is an American element of, I mean, college board has a, I mean, it's in every school between SA or I always get them mixed up, ACT, SAT, I forget which one is. Yeah. It's a name brand, right? That people are comfortable with and familiar with. And what I would also say, like, there are many cultures or I should say communities that would say, I don't want my kid to be bilingual. I don't want you to be teaching about the rest of the world. I don't want you to to be exposing my kids to that. Like, there are communities that look to adopt this because they might think it's going to benefit their children in the long run that get hard pushed back and say, no, I don't, I don't actually want my kids to, that are going to protest the idea of four years of foreign language. Well, we speak English, right? And so there's some cultural pushback of work. So let me make sure I understand. And so when you're in an IB psych program, that means every class you take in that high school is IB. Is that what you're saying? If you are, so there's something called a, a diploma candidate where a student takes their English language, social studies, science, math, and art class are all going to be IB versions of these classes. But can I be at a so high school? Things largely. I'm sorry. Can I be at a high school where I only elect to take IB psychology and that's the only IB class I take? Yes. Yeah. That's how most schools in the United States work is that there are some magnet schools that only offer IB curriculum, that's it. But most schools will run an IB program and then have students have some choice. So again, I don't understand so why the IB psychology 
program isn't screaming about the benefits of what they're doing. I'll share some local experience here in Lincoln, and Casey, you can tell me if this is typical or not, because you've got way more national experience than I do. My impression was that to, if I'm a student at Lincoln High School, which is the high school in town that has an IB program, I might, op, I might not be going for the IB diploma, but I might decide I want to take IB psychology and I can do that. But in order for that opportunity to exist in my high school and my district had to commit, like you said, five years ago and get an IB program up and running. Yeah, sure. And it's just a huge commitment for that high school. One of the non-obvious commitments, I know when the one here in the, the IB program here in Lincoln started, the administrators at that high school had to do a heck of a lot of negotiating to figure out how to get that program embedded in a district with already pretty strict graduation requirements. And there was a lot of scheduling gymnastics that had to happen to figure out, okay, here's what IB requires. Here's what our district requires. We can say this does this and this does this and this does this. And getting everybody to agree on the IB ninth grade experience actually meeting the geography and civics requirements for the state, blah, 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 a bunch of super boring stuff. So I, I think that might be one of the barriers to entry, Eric, that keeps the program small in the U.S., and that might r limit um, the publicity that you're, the lack of publicity. Is that a very about. polite way of saying turf? Turf wars, but also we've just got a bucket load of infrastructure in U.S. education already. And to change things, it's like changing the course of a huge cruise liner. It's just a lot of work. Does that match your experience, Casey? Yeah. And to add a singleton AP or AP class, right? Take the week-long summer suit, fill the form, boom, 10 days. You can be up and rolling. This is a longitudinal thing, and it's really more about the credits the state requires. Now, this is the nice thing that our state, Michigan, has said. If the student does this, it meets the state curriculum. So we are very free to say we don't have to meet this requirement and this requirement, which then allows. I think for psychology specifically is that most American schools will teach a civics or a U.S. history, I would say, or an econ in that 11th and 12th grade. And so since we don't have to meet that requirement, now we can say like my school offers a geography course, offers a world religions course, and an IB psychology course. We have that freedom that's a luxury, that there's this room and opportunity. So I would say that's a challenge. And then Rod mentioned it too, is that we actually, you have to take seven classes to do the IB program and we only have a six period day at my school. So that's a hot mess for us. And, and we figured out, we make it work and we've got great teachers that will say, I, I, you're free to take my student two hours a week. Once so because we actually teach this wonderful class, this is actually the magic sauce of all things IB is this theory of knowledge course, which is an epistemology. It is just a magical course where it's really about helping to get kids to think critically about the way that we know things from intuition to sense perception to language, to emotion, it's magical. And I would say, I think that is the underpinning that says, why does IB Psych need to have 60 hours or 25% you know, of the course be methods? Because how do we know things in psychological science? We conduct studies, we do observations, we, we watch, we track, analyze, we evaluate, and then we publish. We have shared knowledge. It's not just, let me read this text and with a short summary of a study, like we have to know how to do these things. And that is the magic. And again, for a student to get that in six courses throughout their high school career, when they walk into university saying, I've actually done research in five or six fields already. It's not high, super high quality, right? They're 16 or 17, but they've, they've scraped their elbows. They've got the bloody knees of learning how to ride a bike. Well, I, I, I know we're almost out of time, but I, I, and I don't have to have the last word, but I have two, I have two last thoughts. One is. Uh, 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 Rob, on your side of it, I, I would think Lincoln Public Schools would want to say, we want to have this program because it's going to make us competitive in attracting the best and brightest to our public schools. So give and it, maybe it's not a, a an IB diploma program, but we have IB classes so that we can get the best and brightest and give them the option in our house, at our school. And Casey, I really appreciate your time today and I hope you'll come back and because I think there's other assessment discussions that we would have fun with. <laughs> and 
I, I appreciate the scraped and the magic, but I, I really would like to be convinced, not necessarily by you, but by the IB folks, that the real magic continues after the experience itself. That those students who are in IB psychology, who elect, not are pushed, but who elect to be psychology majors in the college of their choice anywhere in the world, they have a leg up. They are more successful than their non-IB counterparts in finishing their college program, in of those who elect to apply to graduate school, that high school research experience prepared them better for a college undergraduate research experience that prepared them better for a graduate school admissions essay. Yeah, I'd love to have a future conversation. Eric, I know you and I have talked about uh, transferability and transferable skills. And Casey, one of uh, Eric's research interests is what skills should students learn as an undergraduate, specifically undergraduate psychology major, but also an undergraduate and that will transfer to the rest of their lives. And I think there's a fascinating conversation to be had about AP psychology, IB psychology, and high school psychology, and college intro psychology, and what actually are the transferable skills that you should really learn at every point. And we'd never agree on that, but AP and IB have different philosophies on what skills you should come out with. And it would be interesting to talk about that in the context of the IPI and lots of other stuff. I think you'd be shocked at how little students come out of a college psychology course. I, I think you'd be really impressed at what you're doing at the high school level because it's probably a lot more than many college courses do. And Casey, someday I don't get to tell you how to think or how to feel, but if I did, I would say you can stop apologizing for the quality of research that your students are doing because they're doing research and it, I don't think the content of their outcomes or their t-test matters, but for God's sakes, a 16 year old did a t-test and if they did it correctly and they can interpret the p-values, doesn't matter if they did it on the difference between lefties and righties on eating grilled cheese sandwiches. It doesn't matter. They did it and they thought about it and they developed a hypothesis that was testable. And they used R or JASP or SPSS. So that's pretty amazing. So, so I think paralleling this, and I just want to give a shout out to the IPI work as well. And I know that you're involved with that too, but just yesterday at a standards crosswalk of the IPI and the IB psychology outcomes, right? Not just topic objectives, but like outcomes. And boy, when I do a crosswalk between those, I, I look at so much parallel that exists between them. And I know that I worked on part of the revision of the national standards at the high school summit. And I know that there's a revision of those coming that are going to, I think, strongly mirror those APA, IPI uh, initiatives. And if there's anybody that leading the charge of AP with Amy there that can help influence and modify that, boy, she can do it. I just was so lucky to work with her for that week and know how invested she is in the future health, growth, all the things of psychology is that there is you know, hopefully going to be some continued alignment because I, I, I think all the AP teachers out here listening is, we know it's tough. I know it's tough as a former AP teacher too. Boy, 18 chapters is a lot. And, you know, I think these are really healthy conversations that we can have. And, and I need a center to write around that as well as how can we do more by doing less? And I'm super excited. And I guess my last thing I would want to say is it was the summit that helped me grow and challenge myself, I'll learn all the, from these experts. And I was lucky enough to, to sit on STP's civic engagement award after actually listening to, I think it's Bethany Fleck. I, I don't want to screw her name up. I've got to listen. I said, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I want to be doing more. How do you transfer to get people to do things, the magic. And after that, then I, I sent him to the civic engagement award and, and she happened to be, I think the winner of the first year that it sure is. And so that's a way that even high school teachers, and I would just challenge high school teachers that are listening get involved as CP has a place for, for, for high school teachers too. I also sit in the high school grant travel grant award and we haven't offered it as a COVID, but it's given me a, a foot in the door and some connections to just get involved with this discussion. And I guess with that, we also the challenge psychology teachers out there to be the leaders in your buildings for professional development. We need you. If you're listening to this as a podcast listener, as a high school psych teacher, we need you running workshops on cognitive science. Don't wait. Your principal's are thirsty for help and guidance and support. 
right? So go out there and be the leaders to talk about learning theories, to talk about cognitive load theory, do that. Your principals and coworkers are, are thirsty for that knowledge and they want to help students be successful. So that's a whole nother conversation, but a lot of this work can fully come from my involvement with the APA summit and, and trying to throw my hat into the STP stuff as much as I and- can. Also, Casey, hopefully that you'll write up and share your crosswalk between the IB and the APA new learning outcomes. There's a number of outlets. It could be Psychology Teacher Network. There are blogs, depending on what you want to do it. It could be a journal article, depending on what you're doing with that. So don't, don't just think about, talk about sharing and civic engagement. You wrote it for yourself, but odds are others could benefit. That's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. I I really appreciate it. 